name's Joe, and welcome to the fourth, and mercifully, final installment of my Collection Room slash Man Cave Tour. If you haven't seen parts one, two, and three yet, then I'd really appreciate it if you go back and check those out when you get a chance. Today I'm going to be telling you about everything along this wall here. You may recognize some of this stuff in the background of the intros to some of my other videos if you've been paying attention to this channel. This video is going to be really Star Wars heavy because this is the majority of my Star Wars collection that I have out on display. I think I'm going to start out in this top corner here and work my way down and across. So let's get started. Cheers. First up is a print of the cover of Batman number no. 1 printed on canvas that I picked up at Hobby Lobby on clearance for $16 or $17. Right below that on the first detolf is a tin Return of the Jedi lunchbox with a couple of Return of the Jedi glasses from Burger King on either side. My Uncle Alan gave those to me. Right in front of that is my NECA Terminator and Robocop collection. There's an Arnold Terminator from the first movie. There's a T-1000 from Terminator 2. There's the Arnold Terminator from T2 with the minigun and grenade launcher he used to blow up the cop cars at Cyberdyne. And then we have the Terminator 2 Sarah Connor figure. These are all the ultimate versions that NECA released with all the alternate heads and accessories. And I'm really glad I didn't start collecting these until the ultimate versions came out because I would have been replacing those older figures with these anyway. Behind them is a trio of T-800 endoskeletons. The ones on the left and in the center are from a two-pack based on a video game that I haven't played. I got them marked down to $20, so it was kind of like two for one. The only bad thing was that one of these was painted orange and brown, and the other was painted blue and white. I guess it was supposed to imitate the way they looked in the video game. I spray painted one black and dry brushed him with silver acrylic paints, and I spray painted the other one silver and gave him a heavy black paint wash. The endoskeleton on the right is just a standard movie accurate version from NECA. And I have him crushing a human skull with his foot, I think that skull came with one of NECA's ultimate Predator figures. These figures are all really cool, and I especially like the way the pistons work on the endoskeletons, but they are a bitch to keep standing, and they don't hold their rifles very well. Behind them is the Terminator vs. Robocop figure, and the standard Robocop from the first movie. I broke one of my collecting rules because I bought the Terminator vs. Robocop figure, even though I haven't read the comic book series that it's based on. But hopefully I can track those comics down eventually, or buy it in trade if it ever gets reprinted. I really don't care for the Robocop sequels, but I love the first movie, and these figures are fucking sick. Right below them on the first shelf in this detolf is my Star Wars Bespin display. In the center is the Power of the Jedi Carbon Freeze Chamber playset. The platform is a little small, and it isn't very screen accurate, but I think it looks okay, and I didn't pay very much for it. It has this play feature gimmick where you can Carbon Freeze Han Solo, or most other Star Wars figures if you'd like. I tested it out a few times when I first got it, and it's kind of a pain in the ass, but I think I would have had fun with this when I was a kid. On top here is Darth Vader overseeing the operation. There's Chewbacca with C-3PO on his back, comforting Princess Leia. Then on the next level are a couple of Stormtroopers and Boba Fett, and there's Lando Calrissian checking to see if Han Solo is still alive in there. Then all around this playset are other 3 and 3 quarter inch figures acting out different scenes from Cloud City. There's Han Solo in the torture rack with a couple of custom Bespin guards I made out of those crappy Playmate Star Trek figures. There's Darth Vader altering the deal, and Lando praying that he doesn't alter it any further. There's a couple more Bespin guards there. The one on the right is a custom repaint of the one on the left. I just did that to add a little variety to the ranks, and I think he kind of looks like Steve Martin. Next up, I tried to recreate the scene where Lando leads the heroes to the dining room where Darth Vader and Boba Fett are waiting on them. This Black Series Vader may be the best Darth Vader figure ever made. He's super articulated, he's big and imposing, the helmet looks great, and he comes with a bunch of accessories, including this blast effect that plugs into the palm of his hand. And I apologize for this being so hard to see, but over on this side is the old vintage original trilogy collection Bespin Luke Skywalker next to R2-D2. Then there's the variant Alien Bespin Guard from the Legacy Collection. And up there is the blue-carded Saga Collection Bespin Luke with a suction cup weather vane that he can hang from. This is an electronic rocket raccoon toy from the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie that I bought for $8 on clearance at Walmart. And I really like this a lot. Asleep for the danger, awake for the money, as per usual. I think it must be based on an earlier bit of concept art for the character because he has these plates sculpted on his head that he doesn't have in the movie. Locked and loaded! No need to be so bossy! I told you I had a plan! 
You can press down on the scope of his rifle, and he has a button on his leg, too. It's rocket time! He says a bunch of phrases from the movie, and I think it sounds a lot like Bradley Cooper. I give this to kids to play with when they come down here, so they don't try to play with my other stuff that's fragile or expensive or set up a certain way. But really, everyone loves this thing. It's rocket time! I can't believe they didn't sell very well when they were in stores, because it's fun as hell to play with. And I wish I'd bought a few more of them to give out as gifts. Group, we're gonna be rich! You gotta be kidding me! You wanna get to him? You go through us. Or more accurately, we go through you. Quill, I need ammo! I might be furry, but I'm tough as nails. Reset the ammo and let's go! Oh, come on! I don't got that long of a lifespan anyway! <laughs> Next we have my custom Hoth Defense playset slash diorama. This is based on a Power of the Force 2 era playset. The base is insulation styrofoam, and I use paper clay to make the trench parts blend into the base. It's really meant for the trenches to be lined up, but I staggered them instead to make it a little bit more interesting. I think I have one example of every different Hoth Rebel soldier made since Kenner brought the 3 and 3 quarter inch Star Wars figures back to the market in the 1990s. Obviously, it's not accurate to the movie to have Luke and Han and Leia here, but setting them up this way feels like something Kenner would have done for box art on a vintage playset back in the day, and I think it looks cool. Next up is my custom Bounty Hunter Showdown, or Battle for Boba's Bounty Diorama. I did a really in-depth video review of this diorama, and my entire collection of Bounty Hunter action figures a few months back. I'd really appreciate it if you go back and check out that video if you're interested in finding out more about this display. Basically, this is based on an idea I had, where all the bounty hunters converge on Boba Fett's hideout, hoping that they can steal Han Solo away from themselves, so they can collect the bounty from Jabba the Hutt. So this is like the moment before they all have a battle royale. On the bottom shelf of this Detolf is a display meant to recreate the Emperor's arrival on the second Death Star in Return of the Jedi. There's a bunch of stormtroopers standing at attention, the Emperor's being escorted by some Emperor's Royal Guards, and he's being greeted by Darth Vader and... Moff Jerjeroff, or Jerjerod, or whatever his name is. This display stand is from a company called Action Figure Displays, which is no longer in business. The only thing I'm missing is the Imperial Shuttle. Kenner made one to coincide with the release of Return of the Jedi in the early 80s, and Hasbro has reissued the ship twice since then. Once as an FAO Schwartz exclusive, and again as a Target exclusive. Any of them would be really cool to have, but I just don't have the room. And certainly not in this cabinet. So I just pretend there's a shuttle slightly out of frame off to one side or the other. Up here on the wall are two cork boards with some of my mint on card vintage collection and vintage original trilogy collection Star Wars figures. These are all modern Star Wars figures on reproduction card backs. I prefer to put them on these cork boards instead of just tacking them on the wall so I don't have to patch so many holes if I decided to move stuff around or if God forbid I ever have to move houses again. These figures are all in protective star cases that I bought from an online store called Collector Warehouse. And I apologize for the glare, but I'm almost totally dependent on natural light for my videos right now. Alright, so first off, on the top row from left to right on the Star Wars card backs is Ben, Obi-Wan Kenobi, then we have Han Solo, then we have Farm Boy Luke, then we have Princess Leia Organa. On the second row on the Empire card backs, we have a super articulated stormtrooper. There's Darth Vader, there's C-3PO, and Yoda. Then on the bottom row on Return of the Jedi card backs is Chewbacca, TIE Fighter Pilot, Jedi Knight Luke Skywalker, and R2-D2. On top of this big metal cabinet is the Marvel Legends Retro Black Widow figure that came in the old school Toy Biz style card back. And she's riding the motorcycle that came with a more recent modern Black Widow figure. This figure is really plain and simple, but she's one of my favorite Marvel Legends figures from the last year. I think she works better with the bike than the figure that came with it. The bike is just okay. Really the only reason I bought it was for the Black Widow figure that it came with. This isn't going to be the permanent home for a lot of this stuff, 
But I put new figures on top of shelves and cabinets for a while to enjoy them before they go into storage, unless I have a spot for them to go on permanent display somewhere. These Ponda Baba or Walrus Man figures were originally released in the Vintage Collection, but they either never made it here or I just never found one. Then they got reissued in the Walmart exclusive Black Series line, but again I never saw those hit in my area. Fortunately I was able to buy a couple of them on Walmart.com for a regular retail price. I wanted two of them so I could display one with the flipper hands and one with the furry werewolf hands. This figure has lots of accessories and lots of articulation, so that makes him top 10 material in my book. Behind them is the 12 inch DC Multiverse Gal Gadot movie Wonder Woman action figure by Mattel. I took an in-depth look at this figure in a Wonder Woman collection review last year before the movie came out. This hasn't got as much articulation as I would like, and the lightness could be better, but considering the amount of accessories you get, and the price point, I think this is a pretty worthwhile figure to have in your collection if you're a fan of the character. Up next is a small plexiglass display case with my tiny Rogue One collection. This case was actually made for small lightsaber hilt replicas. I bought two of them online years ago for six or seven dollars shipped, and they work okay for small collections like this. Inside are two Black Series Death Troopers on either side of a 5 POA tank driver, and the only shore trooper I ever found in the wild. Then we have a 5 POA Saw Guerrera, K2SO, the Black Series Jin Urso, and Saw Guerrera's second in command, who is one of my favorite alien designs from Rogue One. He and Saw and the Tank Driver came in a 4-pack with a crappy 5 POA Jin Urso figure that I picked up for $12. Next is an A-Wing fighter from The Last Jedi. The old Power of the Force 2 A-Wing is probably still the definitive A-Wing, but I haven't come across one for a decent price since I started collecting ships and vehicles. This one is okay, but I don't think it's worth the $30 price tag. Right below that inside the case is the 115 scale DeLorean Time Machine from Back to the Future. This was made by Diamond Select. This is the Mr. Fusion version from the very end of the first movie and all of Back to the Future Part 2. This time machine has wheels that fold down to convert to hover mode. I featured this in a video about toys I wish I had when I was a kid. So if you're interested in finding out more about this model, I encourage you to go back and check that video out when you have a chance. Now moving over here to the right is a 12 inch scale Marvel Legends or Marvel Icons Iron Man figure that I picked up for $20 or $25 on clearance at Walmart. I'm really happy with this figure. I don't really collect a lot of 12 inch figures, but if I find one that's really special or really cheap, then I will make an exception. Here we have a 5 POA Darth Vader from the Deluxe Pack with a probe droid that I found on clearance for $9, and the basic 5 POA single carded Obi-Wan Kenobi figure. Next is a DC Collectibles Batman the Animated Series Clayface figure that my wife bought for me. I wasn't going to get this guy, because he takes up a lot of real estate, and I plan on putting all of my Batman the Animated Series figures on a shelf in a detolf eventually. But it doesn't seem like DC Collectibles is going to give us Animated Series style Two-Face or Scarecrow figures, and I doubt they're going to reissue Mr. Freeze and Poison Ivy on individual card backs. You know that big box set that came with Renee Montoya, Bane, Killer Croc, Mr. Freeze and Poison Ivy in the light-up box that's supposed to look like a row of jail cells? DC Collectibles wants $175 for that set, and if you consider the figures would cost $25 each, that means they want $50 for a box that I don't give a flying fuck about, and would just wind up throwing in the garbage anyway. I like those other characters, but I really only wanted Mr. Freeze and Poison Ivy from that set. It blows my mind that we got characters like Roxy Rocket and Baby Doll that nobody asked for, but we may not get major, important villains like Two-Face or Scarecrow. And in order to get Mr. Freeze and Poison Ivy, you have to buy a bunch of figures you may not actually want. Now I'm sorry for the rant there, but since I won't be able to get all the rogues I want, I decided I could use this Clayface figure to fill empty space in my eventual Batman the Animated Series display. And fuck you, DC Collectibles. Right behind them is another one of those plexiglass cases for the miniature lightsaber hilts. And this one is full of reproductions of old, vintage Kenner Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, and Chewbacca action figures. This set came out in the 1990s and was packed with some Topps trading cards. The main way to tell these apart from the real vintage figures is the peg holes in the bottom of their feet. The peg holes on modern figures from 1995 through today are much smaller than on the real vintage figures from the late 70s and early 80s. I actually do have true vintage versions of all these figures, but they've got paint scuffs on them and the tip of Luke's lightsaber is broken off. 
so I prefer to have these on display because they are in pristine condition. Alright, so first off, on the top shelf of this metal file cabinet is the Star Wars action figure display diorama, made by a company called Pride Displays. It has this sweet sculpted diorama base that looks like it was made in the 1970s. It has a double-sided cardstock backdrop, so you can either display it with a space scene or a Tatooine slash sandcrawler scene in the back. It also comes with 50 clear plastic figure stands with pegs for vintage and modern Star Wars figures. This set came in a neat box that was also designed to look like it was from the original Kenner Star Wars line. I've read that Pride Displays was planning on doing more sets like this at one point, but unfortunately the company is no longer in business. This set was originally sold for around $70, but if you can get a hold of one of these without spending an arm and a leg, I would highly recommend it. This diorama is populated mostly with figures that are my favorite versions of each character. There's a vintage original trilogy collection Tusken Raider. There's a super articulated vintage collection C-3PO with all the removable panels. There's a legacy collection Obi-Wan Kenobi figure, which is probably my all-time favorite Star Wars figure. And we have a 30th anniversary collection Darth Vader figure that came with a stand meant to look like the vanquished Obi-Wan Kenobi's robes falling onto the floor. This Princess Leia figure in the front is from the Power of the Force 2 era, and even though the head sculpt isn't that great, she is far from the ugliest Princess Leia figure ever made, and I think her all-cloth outfit is very well done. These three figures were customized to look more like their vintage counterparts. That Luke Skywalker figure has the same telescoping lightsaber gimmick that the vintage Kenner figures did. But his tunic was cast in gray plastic for some reason. So I repainted it cream color, I repainted his hair yellowy brown, and I even added the dots to his belt buckle to make him look more like the vintage version. I customized this Han Solo figure to make him look more like the vintage big head version of Han Solo, and I repainted the compartments on Chewbacca's bandolier white, just like the vintage version. Next we have a reproduction of the vintage rocket firing Boba Fett that came out several years ago as a mail-away promotion. There's a Darth Vader figure with a light-up lightsaber. And these weren't very popular with collectors at the time um, because they didn't have very much articulation, but I really would have loved that when I was a kid. I think that's a really cool gimmick. And that's the most recent probe droid figure that came out last year. And this is my custom diorama of the Millennium Falcon cockpit. Whenever I build a diorama for my Star Wars figures, I try to make it look and feel as if it was an actual playset made by Kenner or Hasbro. Whereas the cockpits and all the official Millennium Falcon toys are way too small, mine is probably too big. But I prefer it this way because it easily seats four and they don't look like they're crammed in there. This was made out of a styrofoam bait bucket with a window section cut out and a slab of styrofoam for the floor. I'd go into more detail, but I think this deserves a video of its own. So I won't go into all the specifics right now. I'm really happy with the way this turned out. It's super fun to swap out different figures and to take pictures of. I swapped out the left hand on this Bespin Han Solo figure with a Rebel Fleet Trooper so he could give C-3PO the forward finger. Next is my Junlin Waste Diorama. This is meant to recreate the scenes from A New Hope where Luke and 3PO track down the runaway R2-D2, get attacked by the Sand People, and where we first meet Obi-Wan Kenobi. This diorama was made out of insulation styrofoam, and it is intended to look like a playset that Kenner or Hasbro might have produced. I'm using a Farm Boy Luke figure from the Resurgence of the Jedi Legacy Collection Battle Pack, a Power of the Force 2 Freeze Frame C-3PO, a Legacy Collection Obi-Wan Kenobi, and I think I have at least one example of every Tusken Raider figure made since the 90s. And this is the Vintage Collection Landspeeder vehicle on the front. I did a really in-depth review of this custom diorama and all the figures for my channel a while back, so you can go back and check that out if you're so inclined. Here we have a custom Dagobah diorama that I modeled after the vintage Kenner Dagobah playset. I thought about trying to buy a loose Dagobah playset and painting it up, but ultimately I decided I could just make it myself without spending much money. And I included some different features to recreate scenes from The Empire Strikes Back. There's the entrance to the cave where Luke has his vision of Darth Vader. Here we have Luke Skywalker levitating some stones with a force. And I made Yoda's home a separate piece, so it's easier to get figures in and out. I'm also utilizing Dagobah figure stands that came included with this Luke Skywalker, this Yoda, and this R2-D2 figure from the original trilogy collection. 
This is the original Trilogy Collection Luke Skywalker figure. He came with alternate heads and arms, so you could have him backpacking with Yoda, or doing a handstand. It's a clever idea to help achieve these poses, and it looks better than giving the figure all the articulation needed to do it without swappable alternate parts. Case in point is this Black Series version of Dagobah Luke, with double jointed elbows. The arms on this figure are pretty ugly, but aside from that he's not too bad. And I bought him because I want to support Hasbro when they try to make innovations and improve their figures. Here we have the super articulated, vintage collection, Dagobah Landing Luke Skywalker figure. And here we have the vintage collection, Bespin Fatigues Luke Skywalker figure. And these two are some of my favorite Star Wars figures because they have very good articulation and they are also aesthetically pleasing. Back to the diorama though, these scenes from Dagobah are some of my favorites from all of Star Wars. So I tried to go all out for this diorama. There's lots of vines made from twisty ties, stones made from clay, and I even did a puddle of swamp water here. I tried to make it look like this area was lifted straight out of the swamp, and I'm still really happy with the way it turned out. Next is my medical frigate diorama, based on the very end of The Empire Strikes Back. This diorama is mostly made from foam core board, with balsa wood tiles and sticky back foam sheets for all the various panels. There's a Legacy Collection Medical Frigate Luke Skywalker, getting his new robotic hand put on. He's sitting in the gunner chair for my vintage Kenner Ecto-1 from the real Ghostbusters line, with some extra bits glued onto it. It may be kind of hard to see because of the glare, but the main feature of this diorama is a Millennium Falcon flying off outside the window. I actually built a small box for the Millennium Falcon. I painted it all black inside and out so it doesn't stand out at all in the back of the diorama. Inside is a little Millennium Falcon model that was actually a charm from a keychain. I gave it a paint wash, and I drilled a hole in it from an angle. Then I poked a nail through the back of this shadow box part into the Falcon to make it look like it's suspended in the air. No matter what angle you look at it from through the window, you can't see the nail I used to attach it to the back of the diorama. Then I just painted the small white dots inside the box for all the stars, and I attached it to the back of the medical frigate diorama. And I think it looks pretty convincing. Building dioramas based on natural environments like the Junlin Waste and Dagobah dioramas I made are a lot more easygoing, and you can be more creative. But with the interior of a spaceship or a space station, you have to measure everything and be much more precise. It's a little nerve-wracking at times, but it's still really rewarding and fun to do. Up next is my Jabba's Throne Room diorama. Kenner and Hasbro have produced lots of different aliens and creatures from Jabba's Palace, and they are among some of the best, most fun Star Wars figures ever made. So I wanted this diorama to showcase my figures and be a way to act out scenes from the movie. I built this diorama with tiers or stairs on each side of Jabba's throne so you could see the individual figures more clearly. I didn't end up buying the sail barge, mostly because I just don't have room for it. But I would also like to do a cutaway styled sail barge diorama eventually. So I could put Jabba and some other characters inside it, have a sail barge cannon on the deck with some of Jabba's goons, and have a section of the outside of the barge for Luke to climb up and for Boba Fett to crash into. This Jabba the Hutt is from the Legacy Collection, if I remember correctly. He actually came with a rolling throne, but I decided to save that to use for a sail barge diorama that I still have yet to build. <laughs> I made the throne out of a styrofoam brick. This Jabba also came with some pillows, but I made a handful more, and I made a big rug for him to lie on also. I sculpted the gargoyle heads on his throne from scratch, and the rings are just twisty ties. This diorama has a little play feature too. This trap door is removable, and there's a shallow hole for the figures to fall into. You do have to bend the figure's knee joints to make it more believable, but I didn't want to make the floor any deeper than it is, and this works well enough for my purposes. I used a chain link fence section from a WWE wrestling arena that I bought on clearance for the grate that Java uses to watch enemies and traitors get eaten by the Rancor. I made custom figure stands out of paper clay, and I drilled holes in the floor of the diorama so I could use these small foot pegs from my Ultrama sets to help keep the figure standing up more securely. This is a really simple diorama that doesn't necessarily take up a lot of space, and I feel like this is a really effective way to display your action figures, and I would have had a lot of fun playing with something like this when I was a kid. I don't see any reason why Hasbro couldn't make a simple diorama or playset like this without any electronics or stupid gimmicks like Force Link for $30 or $40. Alright, this is the big one. Here's my custom Battle of Endor or Shield Generator Assault diorama. 
The bunker or the entrance to the shield generator is from a Power of the Force 2 era playset that came with some plastic trees that I have in the back there, and a shitty Ewok catapult that didn't work. The base is a slab of insulation styrofoam. I cut up an old ratty hand towel, I glued the pieces onto the base, and I painted over with green acrylic paint for all the grassy spots. The trees are paper towel rolls with a thin layer of clay smeared over them. I used a plastic fork raked over the clay to get the texture for the tree bark. The branches are twisty ties wound up together and dipped in plastic dip. I painted all the trees brown, and I bought some plastic greenery at Michael's to glue on the tips of the tree branches. All the rocks and the two boulders in the front were sculpted out of styrofoam. I think I have at least one of every different version of the Andor Rebel Soldier produced since the 1990s represented here. But the ones that are pre-posed with less articulation are mostly filling space in the back. This Imperial Speeder bike is from the Legacy Collection. I think this might have been a Toys R Us exclusive. It looks amazing and I really like it a lot, but the flight stand takes up a lot of real estate, and it's way too tall. The speeders flew closer to the ground in the movie, more like a regular motorcycle. Here's my custom kit-bashed Nick Sant figure. Here's a couple of the old Power of the Force 2 speeder bikes, which was just a rehash of the vintage Kenner speeder bike. These aren't as good as the newer ones, but I think they still hold up fairly well, and I only spent about $5 each for the ones I have. The Power of the Force 2 biker scouts are garbage, so I replaced them with super articulated versions, and I think they look fine. And I have a Jedi Luke Skywalker, an indoor poncho, taking on one of them here. Then we have the Walmart exclusive Legacy Collection ATST Walker. This is a definitive version of the Check and Walker, and it's been reissued a number of times. In fact, I still see these at my local Walmart stores, so they're still available if you want one. I've seen these marked down to as little as $15. I would have bought another one for that price for my Hoth Imperials if it didn't have the brown paint on it. Mine was given to me as a gift, but I would probably be really pissed if I paid full retail for this, only to find them clearance for so little a few years later. This is a really great vehicle, though. It has a two-seater cockpit, interchangeable chin cannons, and fully articulated legs. This is the ATSC equivalent to the Big Millennium Falcon. It's the most detailed, most screen accurate version of the ATSC ever made. Then here in front of the bunker are the Shield Generator Assault R2-D2, the black carded Saga Collection C-3PO that came with the Ewok throne, there's the vintage original Trilogy Collection Endor Leia, and the blue carded Saga Collection Endor Han Solo. This is one of those gimmicky figures with an action feature but I think he looks pretty dynamic, and he's the only figure that comes with the bombs they used to blow up the shield generator. I've also got some of my favorite Ewok figures on display in this diorama as well. I think this one's name is Tebow from the Power of the Jedi line, and this is the Vintage Collection Wicket. This diorama took a lot of careful planning and time to build, but it was a lot of fun to put together. I've gotten a lot of compliments on this one, and I'm really proud of it. This is the DC Collectibles Court of Owls mask, it came with a trade paperback of the first volume of the Court of Owls story arc from the New 52 Batman comics. I think I only paid $20 for the set at a convention, and I gave the trade paperback to my dad, since I had all the individual issues and the hardcover version already. I got this case for it at Hobby Lobby, and I really love this thing because it's so creepy looking. A friend of ours named Jennifer came over once, and she was like, What the fuck is that? <laughs> Anyways, if you haven't read the Scott Steiner and Greg Capullo Court of Owls story in Batman, then I highly recommend it. Next we have a shadow box with a bunch of different pins and buttons inside. The Firefly pins on the top are from a Firefly themed loot crate. There's an old set of Batman pins from the late 80's in the bottom, and there are a few freebie buttons from the local comic book shop, and the rest of them came packed in with some of my DC Universe Classics figures. On top of this second detolf are the other two Burger King Return of the Jedi glasses that my Uncle Alan gave me. And then we have my entire collection of Star Wars The Force Awakens action figures. Most of the figures in front here are from the super articulated Walmart exclusive Black Series line. I don't think I've ever seen one of these Poe Dameron figures that had good paint apps on its face. So I just settled on one and repainted the head myself. These Finn and Rey figures are pretty solid, but Rey didn't come with a lightsaber. So I had to pill for one from a Luke Skywalker figure to give to her. The sculpting and paint detail on the head sculpt from this 5 POA Han Solo figure looked a million times better than the Walmart exclusive Black Series Han Solo. So I bought two of these figures on clearance at Target for $3, and I slapped one of the heads on him. Hasbro never made an articulated Chewbacca figure for The Force Awakens, so I'm using this older Chewbacca. And I can't remember what specific line or set he's from originally, 
but I like to use him here because I think the heavy-handed gray paint makes him seem older. You know, we hadn't seen Chewbacca for nearly 40 years, and I think they should have added a little gray to his coat in the movie to make him seem like he's aged right along with everyone else. Oh, and I painted the bloody handprint on this First Order Stormtrooper to turn him into a Finn in Stormtrooper armor. All the other figures you see here are the basic 5 POA figures, and with the exception of the two First Order Stormtroopers in the very back, I paid $5 or less for all of these. They just aren't worth more than 2 to $5. The paint apps are horrible, so you have to dig through dozens to find one that doesn't have some major paint problem. Some of them barely hold their weapons and accessories, and some of them won't stand on their own without the use of a peg stand. I really hope the Vintage Collection is successful and we get super articulated redos of most of these figures. If they seem a little cramped up here, it's because I just picked up this First Order Special Forces TIE Fighter at Walmart for $9 on clearance. Even though it came in a box with Last Jedi branding on it, I feel like these TIEs were much more prominent in The Force Awakens, and I prefer to display it with these figures. I think $9 was a fair price for this. After handling it for a few minutes, it's obvious that it isn't as well made as some of my older Star Wars vehicles. The wings are made of softer plastic, so they look warped. Plus, they kept popping off. Just like with some of the older Hasbro TIE Fighters, this has a play feature where you can eject the wings to simulate battle damage. But these wings just popped off by themselves a few times, and nearly broke my Return of the Jedi glasses. So I took the ship apart and removed the springs to deactivate the play feature. So it's not as good quality as any of my other Star Wars vehicles, but it looks okay from a distance. On the top shelf inside this Detolf cabinet are some oddball Star Wars collectibles. They don't really fit in with the rest of my collection. First we have a Disney Store exclusive 12 inch electronic X-Wing fighter pilot Luke Skywalker and Stormtrooper figures. And these figures have buttons on their chests that you can press and they play phrases and dialogue from the movies. They also have a button on their left arm that makes blaster noises and lights up the muzzles on their blasters. I'd play some of them for you now, but I took the batteries out so they don't corrode. I really love these figures a lot. I think they retailed between $20 and $30 each, and I would have bought more of them if I had more space to display them. They're a lot of fun to play with, but the main reason I like them is because they scale so well with my vintage Kenner 15-inch Darth Vader figure on the right. This Darth Vader doll was a hand-me-down for my brother. He's one of the only vintage toys I have on display in my collection, because he's in such good condition. This is the only complete example I've ever seen in person. I even have his original box. This is one of my most prized possessions, and if you're interested in finding out more about him, then you can scroll through my videos for a really in-depth review of this vintage Darth Vader. In between them is a Han Solo and Carbonite Block coin bank from Diamond Select Toys. Then we have my small collection of 6-inch Black Series figures, starting out with Han Solo and Chewbacca. I got this Kylo Ren at Walmart, marked down to $7. There's the Black Series Farm Boy Luke Skywalker figure, and I think this figure is cool or else I wouldn't have bought him, but I don't understand how Hasbro can make a 3 and 3 quarter inch figure with a better likeness to the actor than a 6 inch figure. Han Solo is the same way. He looks great, but he doesn't look like Harrison Ford. Then we have the only Black Series Boba Fett I've ever seen in person. He looks fine standing straight up like this, but the big pouches on his thighs really limit the range of motion in his legs. Those should have been either made out of really soft, pliable material, or better yet, have hinge joints in the top. Plus, it's ridiculous that the rangefinder on his helmet isn't articulated. I have a handful of 3 and 3 quarter inch Boba Fett figures with articulated rangefinders, so I don't understand why they couldn't give one to a 6 inch version. Then we have the Target exclusive Rogue One 3 pack with Jyn Erso, Cast and Andor, and a Death Trooper. I picked this up on clearance for $15. I really like the Cassian and the Death Trooper, but the Jyn Erso is just so-so. The lightness on her is pretty lousy, but Cassian looks pretty spot on to me. The K2SO and the First Order Stormtrooper are die-cast metal elite figures that are Disney Store exclusives. I remember buying these on Valentine's Day the year before last, when my wife and I went to a Disney store to kill some time before we saw hidden figures. I got the K2SO for $10 and the Stormtrooper for 5 These figures are made mostly out of die-cast metal, which makes them really heavy, and their ankle joints aren't super tight, so they aren't the most stable figures. The Stormtrooper is just okay, but I really love the K2SO. I think he fits in really well with these Black Series figures, in my opinion. Finally, we have the Gentle Giant animated-style statue of Princess Leia in the Bausch or Boosh bounty hunter disguise. 
This is kind of a one-off for me because I don't really collect statues, but this one really jumped out at me for some reason. I think it looks awesome, and the paint apps on this are excellent. The same goes for this gentle giant Boba Fett bust here in front. This is a really nice piece, and I think I only gave about $15 for this at a local convention. I like the idea of collectors having the option of either 6 inch scale Star Wars figures or their traditional 3 and 3 quarter inch scale. But it seems like Hasbro either can't or won't devote the same amount of care and attention into both scales at the same time. Obviously I like some of these 6 inch figures or else I wouldn't own them. But the bottom line is that I'm in too deep on the 3 and 3 quarter inch line to start over in a new scale. And I think something as big and epic as Star Wars is better served by a smaller scale figure line because they don't take up as much space, there's at least potential for better character selection, and you have a better chance of getting vehicles and play sets in the 3 and 3 quarter inch scale than with 6 inch scale. Plus, every time I see photos online of someone's 6 inch Star Wars figure collection, they're all just standing around in neutral poses like they're waiting on a bus, instead of acting out action scenes like I do with some of my 3 and 3 quarter inch scale figures. I hope the vintage collection is successful, so Hasbro, again, will see the value of super articulated 3 and 3 quarter inch scale figures. Maybe it'll help pull Star Wars out of the slump it's been in for the last few years. Right below that is my vintage collection TIE Fighter, with some TIE Fighter pilots, Stormtroopers, a couple of Death Star Gunners, a couple of Rogue One Imperial ground crew members, and some Imperial droids in the back. Moving down to the next shelf is my Target exclusive Legacy Collection Rancor Monster, with Jedi Knight Luke Skywalker, a Gamorrean Guard, the Rancor Keeper and his alien friend, and there's a custom Ula figure that I made from an orange Twilight character from one of the prequels. The mini diorama is supposed to be the gate of the Rancor pit. Most of the dioramas and displays I put together now are designed to fit inside a Detolf cabinet, but I made this before I had the Detolfs, so everything is kind of jammed in there right now. And I don't think it looks too bad, but I'd like to take the time to redo this or make a new gate for the Rancor pit that doesn't take up as much space, so I can display the Rancor in a better pose. Then finally on this bottom shelf is my Expanded Universe collection. I built this diorama specifically to display my EU figures. It's made out of foam core board, covered with sticky back foam sheets for all the panels, craft sticks for the trim, and bits of junk for my fodder bin for a few little details here and there. I meant for this to look like a generic space station, and I wanted it to hold as many figures as possible. On the top shelf are some of my Expanding Universe comic book 2-pack Luke Skywalker figures. Most of these I bought loose on eBay because I really only wanted the Luke Skywalker figures. First is the Dark Horse Comics Rebellion Luke Skywalker in the all-black body armor. Then we have a Luke Skywalker from an old Marvel comic. I like this because it puts me in mind of his Dagobah fatigues. Next is the Dark Empire Luke Skywalker. Then we have Jedi Knight Luke Skywalker from an Evolution set. And then we have a Luke Skywalker from Heir to the Empire. On the next shelf down is a battle damaged video game Darth Vader. Then we have some of my Boba Fett figures from the Expanded Universe. Right behind Vader is a prototype Boba Fett. Then we have first appearance Boba Fett from the Star Wars Holiday Special. There's Boba Fett from a Marvel comic where he escapes the Sarlacc Pit. Then there's the Kmart exclusive Judo cast. Moving back to the front is the Clone Wars C-3PO with custom painted eyes and R2-D2. And behind them is the Ralph McQuarrie concept Boba Fett. And it might be kind of hard to see, but behind them is the old Power of the Force 2 Kyle Katarn figure from the Dark Forces first person shooter game. There's some alien Jedi chick from Clone Wars. I don't even know what her name is. I just thought she was kind of a cool character design. Then we have Grand Admiral Thrawn. Moving down to the bottom shelf, right in front is a Jump Trooper and an Evo Trooper from some Star Wars video game that I've never played. And I guess you can call me a poser because I bought these figures without having played the game, but I'm a sucker for different variations of Stormtrooper armor. Then moving left to right is the Ralph McQuarrie concept Han Solo, Chewbacca, R2-D2, and C-3PO. Right in the center is an animated style Darth Vader figure. Then we have R2-D2 and C-3PO from Star Wars Rebels, next to an animated style Chewbacca, and a custom animated style Princess Leia and Hoth gear that I made from a Clone Wars Padme figure. On the next row are my Shadows of the Empire action figures. There's a custom Luke Skywalker in the yellow vest, there's Princess Leia and Prince Zizor from the comic book 2-pack, 
and I repainted that Princess Leia and shaved down her cankles. Right behind Zizor is Chewbacca in his bounty hunter disguise. Then we have Dash Rendar and Luke Skywalker in disguise as one of Prince Zizor's guards. Next up is the Dark Trooper from the Dark Forces video game. Then there's Aura Singh. And even though I hate the Phantom Menace, even I can't deny that she's a really cool looking bounty hunter. And then we have Cad Bane from the Clone Wars. I couldn't even make it through the Clone Wars movie, so I didn't watch the show. But he looks really cool, and I think that figure looks realistic enough to go with your movie figures. Finally, there's a badass space trooper from Heir to the Empire, and a few randos in the back. Right up above the door to the bathroom are some pencil drawings I did when I was in high school. On the left is an Indiana Jones drawing depicting scenes from the trilogy. I used some photos for reference, and I think I nailed the likeness of Sean Connery as Henry Jones Sr. I'm quite fond of this part in the corner with Indy riding a horse. In the center is an X-Files drawing, and this was inspired by the poster and some of the promotional images from the first movie. The X-Files was my favorite show at the time, and I loved the first movie. For me, it felt like a big event with more spectacle than they could have done in an episode of the show. I think I did a good job on both of the likenesses, and I used the McFarlane X-Files figures for reference to draw the silhouettes of Mulder and Scully here. Then we have a Han Solo drawing with a collage of other characters around him, and Drew Strusand, I am not. One of my weaknesses has always been drawing mechanical things like vehicles and guns. I've gotten a little better over the years, but it's something I've always struggled with. And here I totally copped out and only drew the cockpit section of the Millennium Falcon instead of the whole ship. And here's my last cork bulletin board with vintage original trilogy and vintage collection figures. First up is the Desert Stormtrooper, or Sand Trooper. There's Grand Moff Tarkin in the center, and then we have the Tusken Raider. On the next row down is Bespin Han Solo, an Imperial Stormtrooper in Hoth Battle Gear, or Snow Trooper for short. Then there's Luke Skywalker in Bespin Fatigues. Then moving down again is General Lando Calrissian, a Gamorrean Guard, and an Emperor's Royal Guard. And finally, down below that is a set of three Star Wars prints by an artist named Cynthia Martin, who, among other things, was one of the artists who worked on the original Marvel Star Wars comics. Obviously, after drawing these characters for so long, she's really been able to pin down the likenesses. Cynthia Martin was super cool, and I talked to her for quite a while at the convention where I got these signed. We talked about The Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen, and she told me about how she trained herself to draw other kinds of things besides superheroes and sci-fi comics so she could be more versatile and marketable in such a competitive field as comics and illustration. She was really interesting to talk to, and it was a pleasure to meet her. Alright, so there you have it. We have officially reached the end of my collection room tour. And as a sign of my gratitude for you seeing this through to the end, I'm going to throw out the digital download codes for Black Panther and Atomic Blonde. You may have heard me talk about the Black Panther movie before. I really enjoyed it a lot. Atomic Blonde is one of those movies that slipped through the cracks. My wife and I would have liked to have gone to see it in theaters, but we never got a chance to. So she bought a copy for us to watch at home a while back, and we both thought it was great. I'd say this is on par with John Wick as far as the fight scenes and action, but there's a lot more going on as far as the story goes. That's not to say it's super complicated, but it's more than just a shoot 'em up with a revenge plot. And the soundtrack is amazing. So to download a digital copy of Black Panther, download the free Movies Anywhere app, or go to redeemeddigitalmovie.com and enter the promo code in the white space there. And to add Atomic Blonde to your digital collection, or to watch it on iTunes, go to uphe.com slash redeem, enter the code below to add this movie to your digital collection, and follow the instructions to watch Atomic Blonde anywhere on your favorite devices. These digital downloads are good for one use only, so if you're the one who redeems them, please leave a comment down below so other people don't waste their time. And I think that's about all for me today. I hope that you were able to get a set of the NECA San Diego Comic Con exclusive movie Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles if you wanted one. And go see the Han Solo movie. I know everybody's ripping it apart right now online, but if you're an old school Star Wars fan, it kicks the shit out of The Last Jedi. Again, I'd like to thank you for watching, and I'd really appreciate it if you'd like this video, share it with your friends, leave a comment in the comment section down below, and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this in the future. So until next time, may the Force be with you, true believers. Take care. Bye.